Chapter Twenty of Historical Tales, Volume Eight, Russian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Historical Tales, Volume Eight, Russian, by Charles Morris. Chapter Twenty, A Window Open to Europe peter the great hated moscow it was to him the embodiment of that old russia which he was seeking to reform out of existence had he been able to work his own will in all things he would never have set foot within its walls but circumstances are stronger than men even though the latter be russian czars in one respect peter set himself against circumstance and built russia a capital in a locality seemingly lacking in all natural adaptation for a city in the early days of the eighteenth century his armies captured a small swedish fort on lake ladoga near the river neva the locality pleased him and he determined to build on the neva a city which should serve russia as a naval station and commercial port in the north why he selected this spot it is not easy to say better localities for his purpose might have been easily chosen there was old novgorod a centre of commerce during many centuries of the past which it would have been a noble tribute to ancient russian history to revive there was riga a city better situated for the baltic commerce but peter would have none of these he wanted a city of his own one that should carry his name down through the ages that should rival the alexandria of alexander the great and he chose for it a most inauspicious and inhospitable site the neva a short but deep and wide stream which carries to the sea the waters of the great lakes ladoga onega and ilmen breaks up near its mouth and makes its way into the gulf of finland through numerous channels between which lie a series of islands these then bore finnish names equivalent to island of hares island of buffaloes and the like overgrown with thickets their surfaces marshy liable to annual overflow inhabited only by a few finnish fishermen who fled from their huts to the mainland when the waters rose they were far from promising yet these islands took peter's fancy as a suitable site for a commercial port and with his usual impetuosity he plunged into the business of making a city to order in truth he fell in love with the spot though what he saw in it to admire is not so clear in summer mud ruled there supreme the very name neva is finnish for mud during four months of the year ice took the place of mud and the islands and stream were fettered fast the country surrounding was largely a desert its barren plains alternating with forests whose only inhabitants were wolves years after the city was built wolves prowled into its streets and devoured two sentries in front of one of the government buildings moscow lay four hundred miles away and the country between was bleak and almost uninhabited even today the traveller on leaving st petersburg finds himself in a desert the great plain over which he passes spreads away in every direction not a steeple not a tree not a man or beast visible upon its bare expanse there is no pasturage nor farming land fruits and vegetables can scarcely be grown corn must be brought from a distance rye is an article of garden culture in st petersburg cabbages and turnips are its only vegetables and a beehive there is a curiosity yet as has been said peter was attracted to the place which in one of his letters he called his paradise it may have reminded him of holland the scene of his nautical education the locality had a certain sacredness in russian tradition being looked upon as the most ancient russian ground by the mouth of the neva had passed rurik and his fellows in their journeys across the varangian sea 
their own sea the czar was willing to restore to sweden all his conquests in livonia and estonia but the neva he would not yield from boyhood he had dreamed of giving russia a navy and opening it up to the world's commerce and here was a ready opening to the waters of the baltic and the distant atlantic st petersburg owed its origin to a whim but it was the whim of a man whose will swayed the movements of millions he was not even willing to begin his work on the high ground of the mainland but chose the island of hares the nearest of the islands to the gulf it was a seaport not a capital that he at first had in view legend tells us that he snatched a halberd from one of his soldiers cut with it two strips of turf and laid them crosswise saying here there shall be a town then dropping the halberd he seized a spade and began the first embankment as he dug an eagle appeared and hovered above his head shot by one of the men it fluttered to his feet picking up the wounded bird he set out in a boat to explore the waters around to this event is given the date of may sixteen seventeen o three the city began in a fortress for the building of which carpenters and masons were brought from distant towns the soldiers served as laborers in this labor tools were notable chiefly for their absence wheelbarrows were unknown they are still but little used in russia spades and baskets were equally lacking and the Tsar's impatience could not wait for them to be procured the men scraped up the earth with their hands or with sticks and carried it in the skirts of their kaftans to the ramparts the Tsar sent orders to moscow that two thousand of the thieves and outlaws destined for siberia should be dispatched the next summer to the neva the fort was at first built of wood which was replaced by stone some years afterwards logs served for all other structures for no stone was to be had afterwards every boat coming to the town was required to bring a certain number of stones and to attract masons to the new city the building of stone houses in moscow or elsewhere was forbidden as for the fortress which was erected at no small cost in life and money it soon became useless and today it only protects the mint and cathedral of st petersburg the new city named petersburg from its founder has long been known as st petersburg while the fort was in process of erection a church was also built dedicated to st peter and st paul the site of this wooden edifice is now occupied by the cathedral begun in 1714 ten years later as regarded a home for himself peter was easily satisfied a hut of logs his palace he called it was built near the fortress fifty-five feet long by twenty-five wide and containing but three rooms at a later date to preserve this his first place of residence in his new city he enclosed it within another building thus it still remains a place of pilgrimage for devout russians it contains many relics of the great czar his bedroom is now a chapel such a city in such a situation should have taken years to build peter wished to have it done in months and he pushed the labor with little regard for its cost in life and treasure men were brought from all sections of russia and put to work disease broke out among them engendered by the dampness of the soil but the work went on floods came and covered the island drowning some of the sick in their beds but there was no alleviation history tells us that swedish prisoners were employed and that they died by thousands death in peter's eyes was only an unpleasant incident and new workmen were brought in multitudes many of them to perish in their turn it has been said that the building of the city cost two hundred thousand lives this is no doubt an exaggeration but it indicates a frightful mortality 
but the feverish impatience of the czar told in results and by seventeen fourteen the city possessed over thirty four thousand buildings with inhabitants in proportion the floods came and played their part in the work of death in that of seventeen o six peter measured water twenty one inches deep on the floor of his hut he thought it extremely amusing as men women and children were swept past his windows on floating wreckage down the stream what the people themselves thought of it history does not say as yet peter had no design of making st petersburg the capital of his empire that conception seems not to have come to him until after the crushing defeat of the swedish monarch charles the twelfth at the battle of pultowa and indeed it was not until eighteen seventeen that it was made the capital it was the fifth russian capital its predecessors in that honor having been novgorod kiev vladimir and moscow to add a commercial quarter to the new city peter chose the island of vasily ostrov the finnish island of buffaloes where a town was laid out in the dutch fashion with canals for streets this island is still the business center of the city though the canals have long since disappeared the streets of st petersburg for many years continued unpaved notwithstanding the marshy character of the soil and in the early days boats replaced carriages for travel and traffic the work of building the new capital was not confined to the czar the nobles were obliged to build palaces in it very much to their chagrin they hated st petersburg as cordially as peter hated moscow they already had large and elegant mansions in the latter city and had little relish for building new ones in this desert capital four hundred miles to the north but the word of the czar was law and none dared say him nay every proprietor whose estate held five hundred serfs was ordered to build a stone house of two stories in the new city those of greater wealth had to build more pretentious edifices peter's own taste in architecture was not good he loved low and small rooms none of his palaces were fine buildings in building the winter palace whose stories were made high enough to conform to others on the street he had double ceilings put in his special rooms so as to reduce their height the city under way the question of its defense became prominent the swedes the mortal enemies of the czar looked with little favor on this new project and their prowling vessels in the gulf seemed to threaten it with attack peter made vigorous efforts to prepare for defense shipbuilding went on briskly on the Sevier river between lakes ladoga and onega and the vessels were got down as quickly as possible into the neva peter himself explored and measured the depth of water in the gulf of finland here some twenty miles from the city lay the island of kronslot seven miles long and in the narrowest part of the gulf the northern channel past this island proved too shallow to be a source of danger the southern channel was navigable and this the czar determined to fortify a fort was begun in the water near the island's shores stone being sunk for its foundation work on it was pressed with the greatest energy for fear of an attack by the swedish fleet and it was completed before the winter's end with the idea of making this his commercial port peter had many stone warehouses built on the island most of which soon fell into decay for want of use but today kronstadt as the new town and fortress were called is the greatest naval station and one of the most flourishing commercial cities in russia while its fortifications protect the capital from dangers of assault in those early days however st petersburg was designed to be the center of commerce and peter took what means he could to entice merchant vessels to his new city the first to appear coming almost by accident was of dutch build it arrived in november seventeen o three and peter himself served as pilot to bring it up to the town great was the astonishment of the skipper on being afterwards presented to the czar to recognize in him his late pilot 
and peter's delight was equally great on learning that the ship had been freighted by cornelis calf one of his old zandam friends the skipper was feasted to his heart's content and presented with five hundred ducats while each sailor received thirty thalers and the ship was renamed the st petersburg two other ships appeared the same year one dutch and one english and their skippers and crews received the same reward these pioneer vessels were exempted forever from all tolls and dues at that port st petersburg as it exists today bears very little resemblance to the city of peter's plan to his successors are due the splendid granite quays which aid in keeping out the overflowing stream the rows of palaces the noble churches and public buildings the statues columns and other triumphs of architecture which abundantly adorn the great modern capital the marshy island soil has been lifted by two centuries of accretions while the main city has crept up from its old location to the mainland where the fashionable quarters and the government offices now stand st petersburg is still exposed to yearly peril by overflow the violent autumnal storms driving the waters of the gulf into the channel of the stream back up terrible floods the springtime rise in the lakes which feed the neva threatens similar disaster in seventeen twenty one peter himself narrowly escaped drowning in the nevsky prospect now the finest street in europe of the floods that have desolated the city the greatest was that of november eighteen twenty four driven into the river's mouth by a furious southwest storm the waters of the gulf were heaped up to the first stories of the houses even in the highest streets horses and carriages were swept away bridges were torn loose and floated off numbers of houses were moved from their foundations a full regiment of carbineers who had taken refuge on the roof of their barracks perished in the furious torrent at kronstadt the waters rose so high that a hundred-gun ship was left stranded in the market-place the czar who had just returned from a long journey to the east found himself made captive in his own palace standing on the balcony which looks up the neva surrounded by his weeping family he saw with deep dismay wrecks of every kind bridges and merchandise horses and cattle and houses peopled with helpless inmates swept before his eyes by the raging flood boats were overturned and emptied their crews into the stream some who escaped death by drowning died from the bitter cold as they floated downward on vessels or rafts it seemed almost as if the whole city would be carried bodily into the gulf the official reports of this disaster state that forty five hundred of the people perished probably not half the true figure of the houses that remained many were ruined and thousands of poor wretches wandered homeless through the drenched streets such was one example of the inheritance left by peter the great to the dwellers in his favorite city his window to europe as it has been called end of chapter twenty recording by linda johnson Chapter 21 of Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian, by Charles Morris. Chapter 21 From the Hovel to the Throne the reign of peter the great was signalized by two notable instances of the rise of persons from the lowest to the highest estate ability being placed above birth and talent preferred to noble descent a poor boy menchikoff by name son of a monastery laborer had made his way to moscow and there found employment with a pastry-cook 
who sent him out daily with a basket of mince pies which he was to sell in the streets the boy was destitute of education but he had inherited a musical voice and a lively manner which stood him in good stead in proclaiming the merits of his wares he could sing a ballad in talking style and became so widely known for his songs and stories that he was often invited into gentlemen's houses to entertain company his voice and his wit ended in making him a prince of the empire a favorite of the czar and in the end virtually the emperor of russia being one day in the kitchen of a boyar's house where dinner was being prepared for the czar who had promised to dine there that day young menchikoff overheard the master of the house give special directions to his cook about a dish of meat of which he said the czar was especially fond and noticed that he furtively dropped a powder of some kind into it as if by way of spice this act seemed suspicious to the acute lad noting particularly the composition of the dish he betook himself to the street where he began again to exalt the merits of his pies and to entertain the passers-by with ballads he kept in the vicinity of the boyar's house until the czar arrived when he raised his voice to its highest pitch and began to sing vociferously the czar attracted by the boy's voice and amused by his manner called him up and asked him if he would sell his stock in trade basket and all i have orders only to sell the pies replied the shrewd vendor i cannot sell the basket without asking my master's leave but as everything in russia belongs to your majesty you have only to lay on me your commands this answer so greatly pleased the czar that he bade the boy come with him into the house and wait on him at table much to the young pie vendor's joy as it was just the result for which he had hoped the dinner went on menchikoff waiting on the czar with such skill as he could command and watching eagerly for the approach of the suspected dish at length it was brought in and placed on the table before the czar the boy thereupon leaned forward and whispered in the monarch's ear begging him not to eat of that dish surprised at this request and quick to suspect something wrong the czar rose and walked into an adjoining room bidding the boy accompany him what do you mean he asked why should i not eat of that particular dish because i am afraid it is not all right answered the boy i was in the kitchen while it was being prepared and saw the boyar when the cook's back was turned drop a powder into the dish i do not know what all this meant but thought it my duty to put your majesty on your guard thanks for your shrewdness my lad said the czar i will bear it in mind peter returned to the table with his wonted cheerfulness of countenance giving no indication that he had heard anything unusual i should like your majesty to try that dish said the boyar i fancy that you will find it very good come sit here beside me suggested peter it was the custom at that time in moscow for the master of a house to wait on the table when he entertained guests peter put some of the questionable dish on a plate and placed it before his host no doubt it is good he said try some of it yourself and set me an example this request threw the host into a state of the utmost confusion and with trembling utterance he replied that it was not becoming for a servant to eat with his master it is becoming to a dog if i wish it answered peter and he set the plate on the floor before a dog which was in the room in a moment the brute had emptied the dish but in a short time the poor animal was seen to be in convulsions and it soon fell dead before the assembled company is this the dish you recommended so highly said peter fixing a terrible look on the shrinking boyar so i was to take the place of that dead dog 
orders were given to have the animal opened and examined and the result of the investigation proved beyond doubt that its death was due to poison the culprit however escaped the terrible punishment which he would have suffered at peter's hands by taking his own life he was found dead in bed the next morning we do not vouch for the truth of this interesting story though told by a writer of peter's time it is doubted by late historians but such is the fate of the best stories afloat and the voice of doubt threatens to rob history of much of its romance the story of menchikoff in its most usual shape states that lefort general and admiral was the first to be attracted to the sprightly boy and that peter saw him at lefort's house was delighted with him and made him his page the pastry cook's boy soon became the indispensable companion of the czar assisted him in his workshop attended him in his wars and at the siege of azov displayed the greatest bravery he accompanied peter in his travels worked with him in holland and distinguished himself in the wars with the swedes receiving the order of st andrew for gallantry at the battle of the neva in seventeen o four he was given the rank of general and was the first to defeat the swedes in a pitched battle at the czar's request he was made a prince of the holy roman empire as prince menchikoff the new grandee loomed high his house in moscow was magnificent his banquets were gorgeous with gold and silver plate and the ambassadors of the powers of europe figured among his guests such was the bright side of the picture the dark side was one of extortion and robbery in which the favorite of the czar outdid in peculation all the other officials of the realm peculation in russia indeed assumed enormous proportions but this was a crime towards which peter did not manifest his usual severity two of the robbers in high places were executed but the others were let off with fines and a castigation with peter's walking-stick which he was in the habit of using freely on high and low alike as for menchikoff he was incorrigible so high was he in favor with his master that the senators who had abundant proofs of his robberies and little love for him personally dared not openly accuse him before the czar the most they ventured to do was to draw up a statement of his peculations and lay the paper on the table at the czar's seat peter saw it ran his eye over its contents but said nothing day after day the paper lay in the same place but the czar continued silent one day as he sat in the senate the senator tolstoy who sat beside him was bold enough to ask him what he thought of that document nothing peter replied but that menchikoff will always be menchikoff the death of peter placed the favorite in a precarious position he had a host of enemies who would have rejoiced in his downfall these who formed what may be called the old russian party wished to proclaim as monarch the grandson of the deceased czar but menchikoff and the party of reform were beforehand with them and gave the throne to catherine the widow of the late monarch under her the pastry cook's boy rose to the summit of his power and virtually governed the country unluckily for the favorite catherine died in two years and a new czar peter the second grandson of peter the great came to the throne Medchikov had been left guardian of the youthful czar to whom his daughter was betrothed and whom he took to his house and surrounded with his creatures and now for a time the favorite soared higher than ever was practically lord of the land and made himself more feared than had been peter himself but he had reached the verge of a precipice there was no love between the young czar and mary Medchikov and the youthful prince was soon brought to dislike his guardian events moved fast 
peter left menchikoff's house and sought the summer palace to which his guardian was refused admittance soon after he was arrested the shock of the disgrace bringing on an apoplectic stroke in vain he appealed to the emperor he was ordered to retire to his estate and soon after was banished with his whole family to siberia this was in seventeen twenty seven the disgraced favorite survived his exile but two years dying of apoplexy in seventeen twenty nine four months afterwards the new czar followed in death the man he had disgraced the other instance of a rise from low to high estate was that of the empress herself whose career was very closely related to that of menchikoff there are various instances in history of a woman of low estate being chosen to share a monarch's throne but only one that of catherine of russia in which a poor stranger taken from among the ruins of a plundered town became eventually the absolute sovereign of that empire into which she had been carried as captive or slave it was in seventeen o two during the sharply contested war between russia and sweden that while charles the twelfth of sweden was making conquests in poland the russian army was having similar success in livonia and ingria among the russian successes was the capture of a small town named marienburg which surrendered at discretion but whose magazines were blown up by the swedes this behavior so provoked the russian general that he gave orders for the town to be destroyed and all its inhabitants to be carried off among the prisoners was a girl catherine by name a native of livonia who had been left an orphan at the age of three years and had been brought up as a servant in the family of m gluck the minister of the place such was the humble origin of the woman who was to become the wife of peter the great and afterwards catherine the first empress of russia in seventeen o two catherine then seventeen years of age married a swedish dragoon one of the garrison of marienburg her married life was a short one her husband being obliged to leave her in two days to join his regiment she never saw him again she could neither read nor write and like menchikoff never learned those arts she was however handsome and attractive delicate and well formed and of a most excellent temper being never known to be out of humour while she was obliging and civil to all and after her exaltation took good care of the family of her benefactor gluck as for her first husband she sent him sums of money until seventeen o five when he was killed in battle it was a common fate of prisoners of war then to be sold as slaves to the turks but the beauty of catherine saved her from this after some vicissitudes she fell into the hands of menchikoff at whose quarters she was seen by the czar struck by her beauty and good sense peter took her to his palace where finding in her a warm appreciation of his plans of reform and an admirable disposition he made her his own by a private marriage in seventeen eleven this was supplemented by a public wedding catherine was soon able amply to reward the czar for the honor he had conferred upon her he was at war with the turks and through a foolish contempt for their generalship and military skill allowed himself to fall into a trap from which there seemed no escape he found himself completely surrounded by the enemy and cut off from all supplies and it seemed as if he would be forced to surrender with his whole force to the despised foe from this dilemma catherine who was in the camp relieved him collecting a large sum of money and presents of jewelry and seeking the camp of the enemy she succeeded in bribing the turkish general or in some way inducing him to conclude peace and suffer the russian army to escape peter repaid his able wife by conferring upon her the dignity of empress 
the death of the czar was followed as we have said by the elevation of his wife to the vacant throne principally through the aid of menchikoff her former lord and master aided by the effect of her seemingly inconsolable grief and the judicious distribution of money and jewels as presents for two years catherine and menchikoff whose life had begun in the hovel and who were now virtually together on the throne were the unquestioned autocrats of russia catherine had no genius for government and left the control of affairs to her minister who was to all intents and purposes sovereign of russia the empress meanwhile passed her days in vice and dissipation thereby hastening her end she died in seventeen twenty seven at the age of about forty years in the same year as already stated the man who had grown great with her fell from his high estate end of chapter twenty one recording by linda johnson chapter twenty two of historical tales volume eight russian this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. historical tales volume eight russian by charles morris chapter twenty two buffooneries of the russian court amid the serious matters which present themselves so abundantly in the history of russia buffooneries of the coarsest character at times find place numerous examples of this might be drawn from the reign of peter the great whose idea of humour was broad burlesque and who despite the religious prejudices of the people did not hesitate to make the church the subject of his jests one of the broadest of these farces was that known as the conclave the purpose of which was to burlesque or treat with contumely the method of selecting the head of the roman catholic church at the court of the czar was an old man named sotov a drunkard of inimitable powers of imbibition and long a butt for the jests of the court he had taught the czar to write a service which he deemed worthy of being rewarded by the highest dignities of the empire peter who dearly loved a practical joke learning the aspirations of the old sot promised to confer on him the most eminent office in the world and accordingly appointed him kniaz papa that is prince pope with a salary of two thousand roubles in a palace at st petersburg the exaltation of sotov to this dignity was solemnized by a performance more gross than ludicrous buffoons were chosen to lift the new dignitary to his throne and four fellows who stammered with every word delivered absurd addresses upon his exultation the mock pope then created a number of cardinals at whose head he rode through the streets in procession his seat of state being a cask of brandy which was carried on a sledge drawn by four oxen the cardinals followed and after them came sledges laden with food and drink while the music of the procession consisted of a hideous turmoil of drums trumpets horns fiddles and hautboys all playing out of time mingled with the ear-splitting clatter of pots and pans vigorously beaten by a troop of cooks and scullions next came a number of men dressed as roman catholic monks each carrying a bottle and a glass in the rear of the procession marched the czar and his courtiers peter dressed as a dutch skipper the others wearing various comic disguises the place fixed for the conclave being reached the cardinals were led into a long gallery along which had been built a range of closets in each of these a cardinal was shut up abundantly provided with food and drink to each of the cardinals two conclavists were attached whose duty it was to ply them with brandy carry insulting messages from one to another and induce them as they grew tipsy to bawl out all sorts of abuse of one another to all this ribaldry the czar listened with delight taking note at the same time of anything said of which he might make future use against the participants this orgy lasted three days and three nights the cardinals not being released until they had agreed upon answers to a number of ridiculous questions propounded to them by the kniaz papa then the doors were flung open and the pope and his cardinals were drawn home at midday dead drunk on sledges that is such of them as survived 
for some had actually drunk themselves to death while others never recovered from the effect of their debauch this offensive absurdity appealed so strongly to the czar's idea of humor that he had it three times repeated it growing more gross and shameless on each successive occasion and during the last conclave peter indulged in such excesses that his death was hastened by their effects as for the national church of russia peter treated it with contemptuous indifference the office of patriarch becoming vacant he left it unfilled for twenty-one years and finally on being implored by a delegation from the clergy to appoint a patriarch he started up in a furious passion struck his breast with his fist and the table with his cutlass and roared out here here is your patriarch he then stamped angrily from the room leaving the prelates in a state of utter dismay soon after he took occasion to make the church the subject of a second coarse jest another buffoon of the court buterlin by name was appointed niat's papa and a marriage arranged between him and the widow of sotov his predecessor the bridegroom was eighty-four years of age the bride nearly as old some decrepit old men were chosen to play the part of bridesmaids four stutterers invited the wedding guests while four of the most corpulent fellows who could be found attended the procession as running footmen a sledge drawn by bears held the orchestra their music being accompanied with roars from the animals which were goaded with iron spikes the nuptial benediction was given in the cathedral by a blind and deaf priest who wore huge spectacles the marriage the wedding feast and the remaining ceremonies were all conducted in the same spirit of broad burlesque in which one of the sacred ceremonies of the russian church was grossly paraphrased peter did not confine himself to coarse jests in his effort to discredit the clergy he took every occasion to unmask the trickery of the priests petersburg the new city he was building was an object of abhorrence to these superstitious worthies who denounced it as one of the gates of hell prophesying that it would be overthrown by the wrath of heaven and fixing the date on which this was to occur so great was the fear inspired by their prophecies that work was suspended in spite of the orders of the terrible czar to impress the people with the imminency of the peril the priests displayed a sacred image from whose eyes flowed miraculous tears it seemed to weep over the coming fate of the dwellers within the doomed city its hour is at hand said the priests it will soon be swallowed up with all its inhabitants by a tremendous inundation when word of this seeming miracle and of the consternation which it had produced was brought to the czar he hastened with his usual impetuosity to the spot bent on exposing the dangerous fraud which his enemies were perpetrating he found the weeping image surrounded by a multitude of superstitious citizens who gazed with open-eyed wonder and reverence on the miraculous feat their horror was intense when peter boldly approached and examined the image petrified with terror they looked to see him stricken dead by a bolt from heaven but their feelings changed when the czar breaking open the head of the image explained to them the ingenious trick which the priests had devised the head was found to contain a reservoir of congealed oil which as it was melted by the heat of lighted tapers beneath flowed out drop by drop through artfully provided holes and ran from the eyes like tears on seeing this the dismay of the people turned to anger against the priests and the building of the city went on the court fool was an institution born in barbarism though it survived long into the age of civilization having its latest survival in russia the last european state to emerge from barbarism in the days of peter the great the fool was a fixed institution in russia though this element of court life had long vanished from western europe in truth the buffoon flourished in russia like a green bay tree peter was never satisfied with less than a dozen of these fun-making worthies and a private family which could not afford at least one hired fool was thought to be in very straitened circumstances in the reign of the empress anne the number of court buffoons was reduced to six but three of the six were men of the highest birth they had been degraded to this office for some fault and if they refused to perform such fooleries as the queen and her courtiers desired they were whipped with rods among those who suffered this indignity was no less a grandee than prince galitzin 
he had changed his religion and for this offence he was made court page though he was over forty years of age and buffoon though his son was a lieutenant in the army and his family one of the first in the realm his name is here given in particular as he was made the subject of a cruel jest which could have been perpetrated nowhere but in the russian court at that period the winter of seventeen forty in which this event took place was of unusual severity prince galitzin's wife having died the empress forced him to marry a girl of the lowest birth agreeing to defray the cost of the wedding which proved to be by no means small as a preliminary a house was built wholly of ice and all its furniture tables seats ornaments and even the nuptial bedstead were made of the same frigid material in front of the house were placed four cannons and two mortars of ice so solid in construction that they were fired several times without bursting to make up the wedding procession persons of all the nations subject to russia and of both sexes were brought from the several provinces dressed in their national costumes the procession was an extraordinary one the new married couple rode on the back of an elephant in a huge cage of those that followed some were mounted on camels some rode in sledges drawn by various beasts such as reindeer oxen dogs goats and hogs the train which all moscow turned out to witness embraced more than three hundred persons and made its way past the palace of the empress and through all the principal streets of the city the wedding dinner was given in biron's riding-house which was appropriately decorated and in which each group of the guests were supplied with food cooked after the manner of their own country a ball followed in which the people of each nation danced their national dances to their national music the pith of the joke in the russian appreciation of that day came at the end the bride and groom being conducted to a bed of ice in an icy palace in which they were forced to spend the night guards being stationed at the door to prevent their getting out before morning though not so gross as peter's nuptial jests this was more cruel and in view of the social station of the groom a far greater indignity a russian state dinner during the reign of peter the great as described by dr birch speaking from personal observation was one in which only those of the strongest stomach could safely take part on such occasions indeed the experienced ate their dinners beforehand at home knowing well what to expect at the czar's table ceremony was absolutely lacking and as two or three hundred persons were usually invited to a feast set for a hundred a most undignified scuffling for seats took place each holder of a chair being forced to struggle with those who sought to snatch it from him in this turmoil distinguished foreigners had to fight like the natives for their seats finally they took their places without regard to dignity or station carpenters and shipwrights sit next to the czar but senators ministers generals priests sailors buffoons of all kinds sit pell-mell without any distinction and they were crowded so closely that it was with great difficulty they could lift their hands to their mouths as for foreigners if they happened to sit between russians they were little likely to have any appetite to eat all this peter encouraged on the plea that ceremony would produce uneasiness and stiffness there was usually but one napkin for two or three guests which they fought for as they had for seats while each person had but one plate during dinner so if some russian does not care to mix the sauces of the different dishes together he pours the soup that is left in his plate either into the dish or into his neighbor's plate or even under the table after which he licks his plate clean with his finger and last of all wipes it with a tablecloth liquids seem to have played as important a part as solids at these meals each guest being obliged to begin with a cup of brandy after which great glasses of wine were served and between whiles a bumper of the strongest english beer by which mixture of liquors every one of the guests is fuddled before the soup is served up and this was not confined to the men the women being obliged to take their share in the liberal potations as for the music that played in the adjoining room it was utterly drowned in the noise around the table the uproar being occasionally increased by a fighting bout between two drunken guests which the czar instead of stopping witnessed with glee we may close with a final quotation from dr birch 
at great entertainments it frequently happens that nobody is allowed to go out of the room from noon till midnight hence it is easy to imagine what pickle a room must be in that is full of people who drink like beasts and none of whom escape being dead drunk they often tie eight or ten young mice in a string and hide them under green peas or in such soups as the russians have the greatest appetites to which sets them a kicking and vomiting in a most beastly manner when they come to the bottom and discover the trick they often bake cats wolves ravens and the like in their pastries and when the company have eaten them up they tell them what they have in their stomachs the present butler is one of the czar's buffoons to whom he has given the name of wioski with this privilege that if any one calls him by that name he has leave to drub them with his wooden sword if therefore anybody by the czar's setting them on calls out wioski as the fellow does not know exactly who it is he falls to beating them all around beginning with prince menshikoff and ending with the last of the company without accepting even the ladies whom he strips of their head clothes as he does the old russians of their wigs which he tramples upon on which occasion it is pleasant enough to see the variety of their bald pates on reading this account of a russian court entertainment two centuries ago we cannot wonder that after the visit of peter the great and his suite to london it was suggested that the easiest way to cleanse the palace in which they had been entertained might be to set it on fire and burn it to the ground End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of historical tales volume eight russian this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org historical tales volume eight russian by charles morris chapter twenty three how a woman dethroned a man we have told how one catherine of lowly birth and the captive of a warlike raid rose to be empress of russia we have now to tell how a second of the same name rose to the same dignity this one was indeed a princess by descent her birthplace being a little german town but if she began upon a higher level than the former catherine she reached a higher level still this insignificant german princess becoming known in history as catherine the great and having the high distinction of being the only woman to whose name the title the great has ever been attached we may here say however that many women have lived to whom it might have been more properly applied in seventeen forty four this daughter of one of the innumerable german kinglings became grand duchess of russia through marriage with peter the coming heir to the throne we may here step from the beaten track of our story to say that russia at this period of its history was ruled over by a number of empresses though at no other time have women occupied its throne the line began with sophia sister of peter the great who reigned for some years as virtual empress catherine the wife of peter became actual empress and was followed with insignificant intervals of male rulers by anne elizabeth and catherine the great these male rulers were peter the second whose reign was brief ivan an infant and peter the third husband of catherine who succeeded elizabeth in seventeen sixty two it is with the last name that we are concerned peter the third though grandson of peter the great was as weak a man as ever sat on a throne catherine a woman of unusual energy for years of their married life these two had been enemies peter had the misfortune to have been born a fool and folly on the throne is apt to make a sorry show he had besides become a drunkard and a profligate the one good point about him in the estimation of many was his admiration for frederick the great since he came to the throne of russia at the crisis of frederick's career and saved him from utter ruin by withdrawing the russian army from his opponents his folly soon raised up against him two powerful enemies one of these was the army which did not object after fighting with the austrians against the prussians to turn and fight with the prussians against the austrians but did object to the prussian dress and discipline which peter insisted upon introducing it possessed a discipline of its own which it preferred to keep 
and bitterly disliked its change of dress. The Tsar even spoke of suppressing the guards as his grandfather had suppressed the corps of the Strelitz. This was a fatal offence. It made this strong force his enemy, while he was utterly lacking in the resolution with which Peter the Great had handled rebels in arms. The other enemy was Catherine, whom he had deserted for an unworthy favourite. But her enmity was quiet, and might have remained so had he not added insult to injury. Heated by drink, he called her a fool at a public dinner before four hundred people, including the greatest dignitaries of the realm and the foreign ministers. He was not satisfied with an insult, but added to it the folly of a threat, that of an order for her arrest. This he withdrew a worse fault under the circumstances than to have made it. He had taught Catherine that her only safety lay in action if she would not be removed from the throne in favour of the worthless creature who had supplanted her in her husband's esteem. Events moved rapidly. It was on the 21st of June, 1762, that the insult was given and the threat made. Within a month the Tsar was dead, and his wife reigned in his stead. On the 24th, Peter left St. Petersburg for Iranianbaum, his summer residence. He did not propose to remain there long. He had it in view to join his army and defeat the Danes, his present foes, with the less defined intention of gaining glory on some great battlefield at the side of his victorious ally, Frederick the Great. The fleet with which Denmark was to be invaded was not ready to sail, many of the crew being sick but this little difficulty did not deter the Tsar. He issued an imperial ukase ordering the sick sailors to get well. On going to his summer residence, Peter had imprudently left Catherine at St. Petersburg, taking his mistress in her stead. On the twenty-ninth, his wife received orders from him to go to Peterhof. Thither he meant to proceed before setting out on his campaign. His feast day came on the 10th of July. On the morning of the ninth, he set out with a large train of followers for the palace of Peterhof, where the next day Catherine was to give a grand dinner in his honour. It was two o'clock in the afternoon when Peterhof was reached. To the utter surprise of the Tsar, there were none but servants to meet him, and they in a state of mortal terror. Where is the Empress? he demanded. Gone. Where? No one could tell him. She had simply gone where and why he was soon to learn. As he waited and fumed, a peasant approached and handed him a letter, which proved to be from Brazau, his former French valet. It contained the astounding information that the Empress had arrived in St. Petersburg that morning, and had been proclaimed sole and absolute sovereign of Russia. The tale was beyond his powers of belief. Like a madman he rushed through the empty rooms, making them resound with vociferous demands for his wife, looked in every corner and cupboard, rushed wildly through the gardens calling for Catherine again and again, while the crowd of frightened courtiers followed in his steps. It was in vain. No voice came in answer to his demand. No Catherine was to be found. The story of what actually happened is none too well known. It has been told in more shapes than one. What we know is that there was a conspiracy to place Catherine on the throne that the leaders of the troops had been tampered with, and that one of the conspirators, Captain Pesek, had just been arrested by orders of the Tsar. It was this arrest that precipitated the revolution. Fearing that all was discovered, the plotters took the only available means to save themselves. The arrest of Pesek had nothing to do with the conspiracy. It was for quite another cause but it proved to be an accident with great results, since the Orloffs, who were deep in the conspiracy, thought that their lives were in danger and that safety lay only in prompt action. As a result, at 5 a.m. on July 9th, Alexei Orloff suddenly appeared at Peterhof and demanded to see the Empress at once. Catherine was fast asleep when the young officer hastily entered her room. He lost no time in waking her. She gazed on him with surprise and alarm. It is time to get up, he said, in as calm a tone as if he had been announcing that breakfast was waiting. Everything is ready for your proclamation. What do you mean? she demanded. Pasek is arrested. You must come, he said in the same tone. This was enough. A long perspective of peril lay behind those words. 
The empress arose, dressed in all haste, and sprang into the coach, besides which Orloff awaited her. One of her women entered with her, Orloff seated himself in front, a groom sprang up behind, and off they set at headlong speed for St. Petersburg. The distance was nearly twenty miles, and the horses which had already covered that distance were in very poor condition for doubling it without rest. In his haste Orloff had not thought of ordering a relay. His carelessness might have cost them dear, since it was a vital moment to reach the city without delay. Fortunately they met a peasant and borrowed two horses from his cart. Those two horses perhaps won the throne for Catherine. Five miles from the city they met two others of the conspirators devoured with anxiety. Changing to the new coach, the party drove in at breakneck pace and halted before the barracks of the Ismailovsky regiment, with which the conspirators had been at work. It was between six and seven o'clock in the morning. Only a dozen men were at the barracks. Nothing had been prepared. Excitement or terror had turned all heads, yet now no time was lost. Drummers were roused and drums beaten. Out came soldiers in haste, half dressed and half asleep. Shout long live the Empress, demanded the visitors. Without hesitation the guardsmen obeyed, their only thought at the moment being that of a free flow of vodka, the Russian drink. A priest was quickly brought, who, like the soldiers, was prepared to do as he was told. Raising the cross, he hastily offered them a form of oath, to which the soldiers subscribed. The first step was taken. The Empress was proclaimed. The proclamation declared Catherine sole and absolute sovereign. It made no mention of her little son Paul, as some of the leaders in the conspiracy had proposed. The Orloffs controlled the situation, and the action of the Ismailovsky was soon sanctioned by other regiments of the guard. They hated the Tsar and were ripe for revolt. One regiment only, the Preobrazhinsky, that of which the Tsar himself was colonel, resisted. It was led against the other troops under command of a captain and a major. The hostile bodies came face to face a few paces apart. The Queen's party greatest in number, but in disorder. The Tsar's party drawn up with military skill. A moment, a word, might precipitate a bloody conflict. Suddenly a man in the ranks cried out, Hurrah! Long live the Empress! In an instant the whole regiment echoed the cry, the ranks were broken, the soldiers embraced their comrades in the other ranks, and falling on their knees begged pardon of the Empress for their delay. And now the throng turned towards the neighboring church of Our Lady of Kazan, in which Catherine was to receive their oaths of fidelity. A crowd pushed in to do homage, composed not only of soldiers, but of members of the Senate and the Synod. A manifesto was quickly drawn up by a clerk named Tiploff, printed in all haste and distributed to the people who read it and joined heartily in the cry of Long Live the Empress. Catherine next reviewed the troops, who again hailed her with shouts, and thus it was that a Tsar was dethroned and a new reign begun without the loss of a drop of blood. There was some little disorder. Several wine shops were broken into. The house of Prince George of Holstein was pillaged, and he and his wife were roughly handled, but that was all. As yet it had been one of the simplest of revolutions. Catherine was empress, but how long would she remain so? Her empire consisted of the fickle people of St. Petersburg, her army of four regiments of the guards. If Peter had the courage to strike for his throne he might readily regain it. He had with him about fifteen hundred Holsteiners, an excellent body of troops on whose loyalty he could fully rely, for they were foreigners in Russia, and their safety depended on him. At the head of these troops was one of the first soldiers of the age, Field Marshal Munich. The main Russian army was in Pomerania under the orders of the Tsar, if he were alert in giving them. He had it in view to annihilate the Danes, to show himself a hero under Frederick of Prussia, Surely a handful of conspirators and a few regiments of malcontents would have but a shallow chance. Yet Catherine knew the man with whom she dealt. The grain of courage which would have saved Peter was not to be found in his make-up, and Munich strove in vain to induce him to act with manly resolution. A dozen fancies passed through his mind in an hour. He drew up manifestos for a paper campaign. He sent to Iranianbaum for the Holstein troops intending to fortify Peterhof but changed his mind before they arrived. 
Munich now advised him to go to Kronstadt and secure himself in that stronghold. After some hesitation he agreed, but night had fallen before the whole party, male and female, set off in a yacht and galley, as if on a pleasure trip. It was one o'clock in the morning when they arrived in sight of the fortress. Who goes there? hailed a sentinel from the ramparts. The emperor. There is no emperor. Keep off. Delay had given Catherine ample time to get ahead of him. Do not heed the sentry, cried Munich. They will not dare to fire on you. Land and all will be safe. But Peter was below deck in a panic of fear. The women were shrieking in terror. Despite Munich, the vessels were put about. Then the old soldier, half in despair at this poltroonery, proposed another plan. Let us go to Ravel, embark on a warship, and proceed to Pomerania. There you can take command of the army. Do this, sire, and within six weeks St. Petersburg and Russia will be at your feet. I will answer for this with my head. But Peter was hopelessly incompetent to act. He would go back to Iranian bomb. He would negotiate. He arrived there to learn that Catherine was marching on him at the head of her regiments. On she came, her cap crowned with oak leaves, her hair floating in the wind. The soldiers had thrown off their Prussian uniforms and were dressed in their old garb. They were eager to fight the Holstein foreigners. No opportunity came for this. A messenger met them with a flag of truce. Peter had sent an offer to divide power with Catherine. Receiving no answer, in an hour he sent an offer to abdicate. He was brought to Peterhof, where Catherine had halted, and where he cried like a whipped child on receiving the orders of the new empress, and being forcibly separated from the woman who had ruined him. A day had changed the fate of an empire. Within little more than six months from his accession the Tsar had been hurled from his throne and his wife had taken his place. Peter was sent under guard to Rupcha, a lonely spot about twenty miles away there to stay until accommodations could be prepared for him in the strong fortress of Schlüsselburg. He was never to reach the latter place. He had abdicated on July 14th. On July 18th, Alexei Orloff, covered with sweat and dust, burst into the dressing-room of the Empress. He had a startling story to tell. He had ridden full speed from Rupcha with the news of the death of Peter the Third. The story was that the Tsar had been found dead in his room. That was doubtless the case, but that he had been murdered no one had a shadow of doubt. Yet no one knew, and no one knows to this day, just what had taken place. Stories of his having been poisoned and strangled have been told, not without warrant. A detailed account is given of poison being forced upon him by the Orloffs, who are said to have, on the poison failing to act, strangled him in a revolting manner by their own hands. Though this story lacks proof, the body was quite black. Blood oozed through the pores, and even through the gloves which covered the hands. Those who kissed the corpse came away with swollen lips. That Peter was murdered is almost certain, but that Catherine had anything to do with it is not so sure. It may have been done by the conspirators to prevent any reversal of the revolution. Prison walls have hidden many a dark event, and we only know that the Tsar was dead, and Catherine on the throne. End of chapter 23 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 24 of Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian, by Charles Morris. Chapter 24 A Struggle for a Throne. While the armies of Catherine II were threatening with destruction the empire of Turkey, and her diplomats were deciding what part of dismembered Poland should fall to her share, her throne itself was put in danger of destruction by an aspirant who arose in the east and for two years kept Russia from end to end in a state of dire alarm. The summary manner in which Peter III had been removed from the throne was not relished by the people. Numerous small revolts broke out, which were successively put down. St. Petersburg accepted Catherine, 
but moscow did not and on her visits to the latter city the political atmosphere proved so frigid that she was glad to get back to the more genial climate of the city on the neva years passed before russia settled down to full acceptance of a reign begun in violence and sustained by force and in this interval there were no fewer than six impostors to be dealt with each of whom claimed to be peter the third murdered emperors sleep badly in their graves the example of the false dimitris generations before remained in men's minds and it seemed as if every russian who bore a resemblance to the vanished czar was ready to claim his vacated seat of these false peters the sixth and most dangerous was a cossack of the don whose actual name was pugachev but whose face seemed capable of calling up an army wherever it appeared and who if his ability had been equal to his fortune might easily have seated himself on the throne the impostor proved to be his own worst foe and defeated himself by his innate barbarity pugachev began his career as a common soldier afterwards becoming an officer deserting the army after a period of service he made his way to poland where he dwelt with the monks of that country and pretended to equal the best of them in piety here he was told that he bore a striking resemblance to peter the third the hint was enough he returned to russia where he professed sanctity dressed like a patriarch of the church and scattered benedictions freely among the cossacks of the don he soon gained adherents among the old orthodox party who were bitter against the religious looseness of the court finally he gave himself out as peter the third declaring that the story of his death was false that he had escaped from the hands of the assassins and that he desired to win the throne not for himself but for his infant son paul the first result of this announcement was that the impostor was seized and taken to kassan as a prisoner but the carelessness of his guards allowed him to escape from his prison cell and he made his way to the volga near its entrance into the caspian sea where he began to collect a body of followers among the cossacks of that region his first open declaration was made on september seventeenth seventeen seventy three when he appeared with three hundred cossacks at the town of yaitsk and published an appeal to orthodox believers declaring that he was the czar peter the third and calling upon them for support his handful of cossacks soon grew into an army multitudes of the tribesmen gathered around him and in a brief time he found himself at the head of a large body of the lowest of the people the man was a savage at heart betraying his innate depravity by foolish and useless cruelties and in this way preventing the more educated class of the community from joining his ranks yet he contrived to gather about him an army of several thousand men and obtained a considerable number of cannon with which he soon afterwards laid siege to the city of orenburg both yaitsk and orenburg defied his efforts but he had greater success in the field defeating two armies in succession these victories gave him new assurance he now caused money to be coined in his name as though he were the lawful emperor and marched northward at the head of a large force to meet the armies of the state his army was destitute of order or discipline and he woefully deficient in military skill yet his proclamation of freedom to the people and the opportunities he gave them for plunder and outrage strengthened his hands and recruits came in multitudes the tartars kirghiz and bashkirs who had been brought against their will under the russian yoke flocked to his standard in the hope of regaining their freedom many of the poles who had been banished from their country also sought his ranks and the people of moscow and its vicinity who had from the first been opposed to catherine's reign waited his approach that they might break out in open rebellion the outbreak had thus become serious and had pugachev been skilled as a leader he might have won the throne 
as it was his followers showed a fiery valor and undisciplined as they were gave the armies of the empire no small concern bibikov who had been sent to subdue them failed through over caution and was slain in the field his lieutenants galitsin and mikkelson proved more active and frequently defeated the impostor though only to find him rising again with new armies as often as the old ones were crushed like the fabulous giant who sprang up in double form whenever cut in twain prince galitsin defeated him twice the last time after a furious battle six hours in length pugachev abandoned by his followers now fled to the urals but soon appeared again with a fresh body of troops between the beginning of march and the end of may seventeen seventy four the rebel chief was defeated six or seven times by mikkelson in the end being driven as a fugitive to the ural mountains but he had only to raise his standard again for fresh armies to spring up as if from the ground and early june found him once more in the field defeated on june four he fled once more to the hills but in the beginning of july was facing his foes again at the head of twenty two thousand men only the cruelty shown by himself and his followers and his ruthlessness in permitting the plunder and burning of churches and convents kept back the much greater hosts who would otherwise have flocked to his ranks and at this critical moment in his career he committed the signal error of failing to march on moscow the principal seat of the old russian faith which he proposed to restore and where he would have found an army of partisans he marched upon kassan instead took the city but failed to capture the citadel here he was making havoc with fire and sword when mickelson came up and defeated him in a long and obstinate fight he now fled to the volga wasting the land as he went burning the crops and villages and leaving desolation in his track men came in numbers to replace those he had lost and an army of twenty thousand was soon again under his command with these he surprised and routed a russian force and took several forts on the volga while the german colonies of moravians which had been established upon that stream and were among the most industrious inhabitants of the empire suffered severely at his hands in the town of saratov he murdered all whom he met as an example of the character of this monster in human form it is related that hearing that an astronomer from the imperial academy of sciences of st petersburg was nearby engaged in laying out the route of a canal from the volga to the don he ordered him to be brought before him when the peaceful astronomer appeared the brutal ruffian bade his men to lift him on their pikes quote, so that he might be nearer the stars end quote. then he ordered him to be cut to pieces the end of this carnival of murder came at the siege of zaritsin here mickelson came up on the twenty second of august and forced him to raise the siege on the twenty fourth the insurgents were attacked when in the intricate passes of the mountains and encumbered with baggage wagons women and camp followers though thus taken at a disadvantage they defended themselves vigorously the mass of them falling in the mountain passes or being driven over the cliffs and precipices pugachev continued to fight till his army was destroyed then made his escape as so often before swimming the volga and vanishing in the desert only about sixty of his most faithful partisans accompanied him in his flight mickelson failing to reach him in his retreat took care that he should not emerge into the cultivated districts but in the end the russians were able to capture him only by treachery they won over some of their cossack prisoners among them Antizov, the nearest friend of the fugitive. These were then set free and sought the desert retreat of their late leader, where they awaited an opportunity to take him by surprise. 
this they were not able to do until november pugachev was gnawing the bone of a horse for food when his false friends ran up to him saying come you have long enough been emperor perceiving that treachery was intended he drew his pistol and fired at his foes shattering the arm of the foremost the others seized and bound him and conveyed him to goroduk in the ural the locality of antizov's tribe mikelsen was still seeking him in the desert when word came to him that the fugitive had been delivered into russian hands at simbirsk and was being conveyed to moscow in an iron cage like the beast of prey which he resembled in character on the way he sought to starve himself but was forced to eat by the soldiers on reaching moscow he counterfeited madness his trial was conducted without the torture which had formerly been so common a feature of russian tribunals the sentence of the court was that he should be exhibited to the people with his hands and feet cut off and then quartered alive with unyielding resolution pugachev awaited this cruel death but the sentence for some reason was not executed he being first beheaded and then quartered four of his principal followers suffered the same fate and thus ended one of the most determined efforts on the part of an impostor to seize the russian throne that had ever been known the undoubted courage of the man was enough to prove that he was not peter the third had he combined military capacity with his daring he could readily have won the throne End of chapter 24. Recording by Linda Johnson. Chapter 25 of Historical Tales, Volume 8. Russian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian, by Charles Morris, Chapter 25, The Flight of the Kalmucks. On the 5th of January, 1771, began one of the most remarkable events in the history of the world, the migration of an entire nation, more than half a million strong, with its women and children, flocks and herds, and all that it possessed, to a new home four thousand miles away more than once many times apparently in the history of the past such migrations have taken place but those were warlike movements with conquest as their aim this was a peaceful migration the only desire of those concerned being to be let alone this desire was not granted and death and terror marked every step of their frightful journey. A century and a half earlier, the fathers of these people, the Kalmuk Tartars, had left their homes in the Chinese Empire and wandered west, finding a resting place at last on the Volga River in the Russian realm. Here they would have been well content to remain, but for the arts and designs of one man, zebek dorchi by name who ambitious to be made khan of the tribe and not being favored in his desires by the russian court determined to remove the whole kalmuk nation beyond the reach of russian control this was no easy matter to do russia had spread to the east until the whole width of asia lay within its broad expanse and its boundary touched the pacific waves to reach china the mighty mongolian plain had to be crossed largely a desert swarming with hostile tribes death and disaster were likely to haunt every mile of the way and a general tomb in the wilderness rather than a home in a new land was the most probable destiny of the migrating horde zebek dorchi was confronted with a difficult task he had to induce the tribesmen to consent to the new movement and that so quickly that a start could be made before the russians became aware of the scheme otherwise the path would be lined with armies 
and the movement checked ubasha the khan of the kalmuks was a brave but weak man the conspirator controlled him and through him the people on a fixed day through a false alarm that the kirghises and bashkirs had made an inroad upon the kalmuk lands he succeeded in gathering a great kalmuk horde eighty thousand in all at a point out of reach of russian ears here with subtle eloquence he told them of the oppressions of russia of her insults to the kalmuks her contempt for their religion and her design to reduce them to slavery and declared that a plan had been devised to rob them of their eldest sons by a skilful mixture of truth and falsehood he roused their fears and their anger and at length he proposed that they should leave their fields and make a rapid march to the temba or some other great river from behind which they could speak in bolder language to the russian empress and claim better terms he did not venture as yet to hint at his startling plan of a migration to far-off china the simple-minded tartars made furious by his skilful oratory accepted his plan by acclamation and returned home to push with the utmost haste the preparations for their stupendous task the idea of a migration en masse did not frighten them they were nomads and the descendants of nomads who for ages had been used to fold their tents and flit away the kalmuk villages extended on both sides of the volga a large section of the horde would have to cross that great stream and this could be done with sufficient speed only when its surface was bridged with ice for this reason midwinter was chosen for the flight despite the sufferings which must arise from the bitter russian cold and the fifth of january was appointed for religious reasons by the leading lama of the tribe the year had been selected by the great lama of tibet the head of the buddhist faith to which the kalmuks belonged and to whom the conspirator had appealed despite the secrecy and rapidity of the movement tidings of it reached the russian court but the russian envoy who dwelt among the kalmuks was quite deceived by their wiles and sent word to the imperial court that the rumors were false and nothing resembling an outbreak was in view the governor of astrachan a man of more sense and discernment sent courier after courier but his warnings were ignored and the fatal fifth of january came without a preventive step being taken by the government then the governor learning that the migration had actually begun sprang into his sleigh and drove over the russian snows at the furious speed of three hundred miles a day finally rushing into the imperial presence chamber at st petersburg to announce to the empress that all his warnings had been true and that the kalmuks were in full flight other couriers quickly confirmed his words and the envoy paid for his blindness by death in a dungeon cell meanwhile the banks of the volga had been the locality of a remarkable event at early dawn of the selected day the kalmuks east of the stream began to assemble in troops and squadrons gathering in tens of thousands a great body of the tribe setting out every half hour on its march women and children several hundred thousand in number were placed on wagons and camels and moved off in masses of twenty thousand at once with escorts of mounted men as the march proceeded outlying bodies of the horde kept falling in during that and the following day from sixty to eighty thousand of the best mounted warriors stayed behind for work of ruin and revenge their first purpose was to destroy their own dwellings lest some of the weak-minded might be tempted to return ubacha the khan set the example by applying the torch to his own palace before the day was over the villages throughout a district of ten thousand square miles were in a simultaneous blaze nothing was saved except the portable utensils and such of the woodwork as might be used in making the long tartan lances 
this was but part of the destruction proposed zebek dorci had it in view to pillage and destroy all the russian towns churches and buildings of every kind within the surrounding district with outrage and death to their inhabitants a frightful scheme which was providentially checked the day of flight had been selected as has been said in the worst season of the year in order that the tribes west of the volga might be able to cross its surface on a thick bridge of ice yet for some reason possibly because of the weakness of the ice the western kalmucks failed to join their eastern brethren and fully one hundred thousand of the tartars were left behind it was this that saved the russian towns it being feared by the leaders that such a vengeance would be repaid upon their brethren left to russian reprisal these western kalmucks little guessed what horrors they were escaping by being prevented from joining in the flight the migrating horde was not less than six hundred thousand strong while a vast number of horses camels cattle goats and sheep added to the multitude of living forms the march was a forced one every day gained was of prime importance for it was well known that russian armies would soon be in hot pursuit while the tribes on their line of march hereditary foes of the kalmucks would gather from all sides to oppose their passage as the news of the flight reached their ears the river jaik three hundred miles away must be reached before a day's rest could be had the weather was not severely cold and the journey might have been accomplished with little distress but for the forced pace as it was the cattle suffered greatly the sheep died in multitudes milk began to fail and only the great number of camels saved the children and the infirm the first of the subjects of russia with whom the kalmucks came into collision were the cossacks of the jaik at this season most of these were absent at the fisheries on the caspian and the others fled in crowds to the fortress of kulajina which was quickly summoned to surrender by the kalmuk khan the russian commandant numerous as were his foes refused knowing that they must soon resume their flight he had not long to wait on the fifth day of the siege from the walls of the fort a number of tartar couriers mounted on the swift bactrian camels were seen to cross the plains and ride into the kalmuk camp at their highest speed immediately a great agitation was visible in the camp the siege was raised and the signal for flight resounded through the host the news brought was that an entire kalmuk division numbering nine thousand fighting men stationed on a distant flank of the line of march and between whom and the cossacks there was an ancient feud had been attacked and virtually exterminated the exhaustion of their horses and camels had prevented flight quarter was not asked or given and the battle continued until not a fighting man was left alive the utmost speed was now necessary for a sufficient reason the next safe halting place of the kalmucks was on the east bank of the turgai river between it and them rose a hilly country a narrow defile through which offered the nearest and best route this lost the need of pasturage would require a further sweep of five hundred miles the cossack light horsemen were only about fifty miles more distant from the pass if it were to be won the most rapid march possible must be made for a day and a night the flight went on with renewed suffering and loss of animals then a snowfall soon too deep to journey through checked all progress and for ten days they had a season of rest comfort and plenty the cows and oxen had perished in such numbers that it was resolved to slaughter what remained feast to their hearts content and salt the remainder for future stores at length clear frosty weather came 
the snow ceased to drift and its surface froze it would bear the camels and the flight was resumed but already seventy thousand persons of all ages had perished in addition to those slain in battle and new suffering and death impended for word came that the troops of the empire were converging from all parts of central asia upon the fords of the turgai as the best place to cut off the flight of the tribes while a powerful army was marching rapidly upon their rear though delayed by its artillery on the second of february uchim the much desired defile was reached the cossacks had been outmarched a considerable body of them it is true had reached the pass some hours before but they were attacked and so fiercely dealt with that few of them escaped the kalmucks here obtained revenge for the slaughter of their fellows twenty days before the road was now open how long it would continue open was in doubt word came that a large russian army led by general traubenberg was advancing upon the turgai he was to be met on his route by ten thousand bashkirs and as many kirghises implacable enemies of the kalmucks from whom they had suffered in past years the only hope now lay in speed and onward the kalmucks pressed their line of march marked by the bodies of the dead the weak the sick had to be left behind nothing was suffered to impede the rapidity of their flight from the starting point on the volga to the halting ground on the turgai counting the circuits that had to be made was full two thousand miles much of it traversed in the dead of winter the cold for seven weeks of the journey being excessively severe napoleon's army in its retreat from moscow suffered no more from the winter chill than did this migrating nation on many a morning the dawning light shone on a circle that had gathered the night before around a sparse fire made from the lading of the camels or from broken-up baggage wagons now dead and frozen stiff as they sat but at length the snows ceased to fall the frost to chill spring came march and april passed away may arrived with its balmy airs vernal sights and sounds cheered them on every side during all these months they continued their march and towards the end of may the turgai was reached and crossed and the weary wanderers having left their enemies far in the rear hoped to find comfort and security during weeks of rest and to complete their journey with less of ruin and suffering they little dreamed that the worst of their task had yet to be endured during the five months of their wanderings their losses had been frightfully severe not less than two hundred and fifty thousand members of the horde had perished while their herds and flocks oxen cows sheep goats horses mules and asses had perished only the camels surviving these hardy creatures had come through the terrible journey unharmed and on them rested all their hopes for the remainder of their flight but another two thousand miles lay before them with hostility in front and in rear should they still go on or should they return and throw themselves on the mercy of the empress ubacha the khan advised return offering to take all the guilt of the flight upon himself zebek dorchi earnestly urged them to proceed and not lose the fruit of all their suffering but the people worn out with the hardships and perils of their route favored a return and a trust in the imperial mercy and this would probably have been determined upon but for an untoward event this was the arrival of two envoys from traubenberg the russian general who after a long and painful march had approached within a few days journey of the fugitives about the first of june 
on his way he had been joined by large bodies of the kirghiz and bashkir nomads the harsh tone and peremptory demands of the envoys aroused hostile feelings among the kalmuk chiefs but the main check to negotiations was the action of the bashkirs who finding that traubenberg would not advance left his camp in a body and set off for the kalmuk halting place in six days they reached the turgai swam their horses across it and fell in fury upon the kalmuks who were dispersed over leagues of ground in search of pasture and food peace at once changed to war over a field from thirty to forty miles wide fighting flight and pursuit rescue and death went on at all points more than once were the khan and zebek dorchi in peril of death at one time both were made prisoners but at length concentrating their strength they forced the bashkirs to retreat for two days more the wild bashkir and kirghiz cavalry continued their attacks and the kalmuk chiefs looking upon these as the advance parties of the russian army felt themselves obliged to order a renewal of the flight thus suddenly ended their hoped-for season of repose one event took place during this period of which it is important to speak a russian gentleman weseloff by name was held prisoner in the kalmuk camp and had been brought that far on their route the khan ubacha who saw no object in holding him now gave him leave to attempt his escape and also asked him to accompany him during a private interview which he was to hold on the next night with the hetman of the bashkirs weseloff declined to do so and bade the khan to beware as he feared the scheme meant treachery about ten that night weseloff with three kalmuks who had offered to join in his flight they having strong reasons for a return to russia sought a number of the half-wild horses of that district which they had caught and hidden in the thickets on the river's side they were in the act of mounting when the silence of the night was broken by a sudden clash of arms and a voice which sounded like that of the khan was heard calling for aid the russian remembering what ubasha had told him rode off hastily towards the sound bidding his companions follow reaching an open glade in the wood he saw four men fighting with nine or ten one who looked like the khan contending on foot against two horsemen weseloff fired at once bringing down one of the assailants his companions followed with their fire and then all rode into the glade whereupon the assailants thinking that a troop of cavalry was upon them hastily fled the dead man when examined proved to be a confidential servant of zebek dorchi the secret was out this ambitious conspirator had sought the murder of the khan accompanying the khan until he had reached a place of safety weseloff and his companions at the suggestion of the grateful ubacha rode off at the utmost speed fearing pursuit their return was made along the route the kalmuks had traversed every step of which could be traced by skeletons and other memorials of the flight among these were heaps of money which had been abandoned in the desert and of which they took as much as they could conveniently carry weseloff at length reached home rushed precipitately into the house where his loving mother had long mourned his loss and so shocked her by the sudden revulsion of joy after her long sorrow that she fell dead on the spot it was a sad ending to his happy return to return to the kalmuk flight two thousand miles still remained to be traversed before the borders of china would be reached all that took place in the dreary interval is too much to tell it must suffice to say that the bashkirs pursued them through the whole long route 
while the choice of two evils lay in front. Now they made their way through desert regions. Now, pressed by want of food, they traversed rich and inhabited lands, through which they had to win a passage with the sword. Every day the Bashkirs attacked them, drawing off into the desert when too sharply resisted. Thus, with endless alternations of hunger and bloodshed, the borders of China at length were approached. And now we have another scene in this remarkable drama to describe. Qin Lung, the emperor of China, had been long apprised of the flight of the Kalmucks, and had prepared a place of residence for these erring children of his nation, as he considered them, on their return to their native land but he did not expect their arrival until the approach of winter having been advised that they proposed to dwell during the summer heats on the tourgais fertile banks one fine morning in september seventeen seventy one this fatherly monarch was enjoying himself in hunting in a wild district north of the great wall here for hundreds of square leagues the country was overgrown with forest, filled with game. Centrally in this district rose a gorgeous hunting lodge, to which the emperor retired annually for a season of escape from the cares of government. Leaving his lodge, he had pursued the game through some two hundred miles of forest, every night pitching his tent in a different locality. A military escort followed at no great distance in the rear on the morning in question the emperor found himself on the margin of the vast deserts of asia which stretched interminably away as he stood in his tent door gazing across the extended plain he saw with surprise far to the west a vast dun cloud arise which mounted and spread until it covered that whole quarter of the sky it thickened as it rose and began to roll in billowy volumes towards his camp this singular phenomenon aroused general attention the suite of the emperor hastened to behold it in the rear the silver trumpets sounded and from the forest avenues rode the imperial cavalry escort all eyes were fixed upon the rolling cloud the sentiment of curiosity being gradually replaced by a dread of possible danger at first the dust cloud was imagined to be due to a vast troop of deer or other wild animals driven into the plain by the hunting train or by beasts of prey this conception vanished as it came nearer until seemingly it was but a few miles away and now as the breeze freshened a little the vapory curtain rolled and eddied until it assumed the appearance of vast aerial draperies depending from the heavens to the earth sometimes where rent by the eddying breeze it resembled portals and archways through which at intervals were seen the gleam of weapons and the dim forms of camels and human beings at times again the cloud thickened shutting all from view but through it broke the din of battle the shouts of combatants the roar of infuriated hordes in mortal conflict it was in fact the kalmuk host now in the last stage of misery and exhaustion yet still pursued by their unrelenting foes of the six hundred thousand who had begun the journey scarcely a third remained cold heat famine and warfare having swept away nearly half a million of the fleeing host while of their myriad animals only the camels and the horses brought from the tourgai remained for the past ten days their suffering had reached a climax they had been traversing a frightful desert destitute alike of water and of vegetation two days before their small allowance of water had failed and to the fatigue of flight had been added the horrors of insupportable thirst on came the flying and fighting mass 
it was soon evident that it was not moving towards the imperial train and those who knew the country judged that it was speeding towards a large freshwater lake about seven or eight miles away thither the imperial cavalry of which a strong body attended with artillery lay some miles in the rear was ordered in all haste to ride and there at noon of september eight the great migration of the kalmucks came to an end amid the most ferocious and bloodthirsty scene of its whole frightful course the lake of tengis lies in a hollow among low mountains on the verge of the great desert of gobi the chinese cavalry reached the summit of a road that led down to the lake at about eleven o'clock the descent was a winding and difficult one and took them an hour and a half during the whole of which they were spectators of an extraordinary scene below the last and most fiendish spectacle in eight months of almost constant warfare the sight of the distant hills and forests on that morning and the announcement of the guides that the lake of tengis was near at hand had excited the suffering host into a state of frenzy and a wild rush was made for the water in which all discipline was lost and the heat of the day and the exhaustion of the people were ignored the rear guard joined in the mad flight in among the people rode the savage bashkirs suffering as much as themselves yet still eager for blood and slaughtering them by wholesale almost without resistance screams and shouts filled the air but none heeded or halted all rushing madly on spurred forward by the intolerable agonies of thirst at length the lake was reached into its waters dashed the whole suffering mass forgetful of everything but the wild instinct to quench their thirst but hardly had the water moistened their lips when the carnival of bloodshed was resumed and the waters became crimsoned with gore the savage bashkirs rode fiercely through the host striking off heads with unappeased fury the mortal foes joined in a death grapple in the waters often sinking together beneath the ruffled surface even the camels were made to take part in the fight striking down the foe with their lashing forelegs the waters grew more and more polluted but new myriads came up momentarily and plunged in heedless of everything but thirst such a spectacle of revengeful passion ghastly fear the frenzy of hatred mortal conflict convulsion and despair as fell on the eyes of the approaching horsemen has rarely been seen and that quiet mountain lake which perhaps had never before vibrated with the sounds of battle was on that fatal day converted into an encrimsoned sea of blood at length the bashkirs alarmed by the near approach of the chinese cavalry began to draw off and gather into groups in preparation to meet the onset of a new foe as they did so the commandant of a small chinese fort built on an eminence above the lake poured an artillery fire into their midst each group was thus dispersed as rapidly as it formed the chinese cavalry reached the foot of the hills and joined in the attack and soon a new scene of war and bloodshed was in full process of enactment but the savage horsemen convinced that the contest was growing hopeless now began to retire and were quickly in full flight into the desert pursued as far as it was deemed wise no pursuit was needed even to satisfy the kalmuk spirit of revenge the fact that their enemies had again to cross that inhospitable desert with its horrors of hunger and thirst was as full of retribution as the most vindictive could have asked here ends our tale
the exhausted kalmucks were abundantly provided for by their new lord and master who supplied them with the food necessary established them in a fertile region of his empire furnished them with clothing tools a year's subsistence grain for their fields animals for their pastures and money to aid them in their other needs displaying towards his new subjects the most kindly and munificent generosity they were placed under better conditions than they had enjoyed in russia though changed from a pastoral and nomadic people to an agricultural one as for zebek dorchi his attempt on the life of the khan had produced a feud between the two which grew until it attracted the attention of the emperor inquiring into the circumstances of the enmity he espoused the cause of ubacha which so infuriated the foe of the khan that he wove nets of conspiracy even against the emperor himself in the end zebek dorchi with his accomplices was invited to the imperial lodge and there at a great banquet his arts and plots were exposed and he and all his followers were assassinated at the feast as a durable monument to the mighty exodus of the kalmucks the most remarkable circumstance of the kind in the whole history of nations the emperor Qin Lung ordered to be erected on the banks of the ili at the margin of the steppes a great monument of granite and brass bearing an inscription to the following effect by the will of god here upon the brink of these deserts which from this point begin and stretch away pathless treeless waterless for thousands of miles and along the margins of many mighty nations rested from their labors and from great afflictions under the shadow of the chinese wall and by the favor of Qin lung god's lieutenant upon earth the ancient children of the wilderness the torgo tartars flying before the wrath of the grecian czar wandering sheep who had strayed away from the celestial empire in the year sixteen sixteen but are now mercifully gathered again after infinite sorrow into the fold of their forgiving shepherd hallowed be the spot for ever and hallowed be the day september eight seventeen seventy one amen end of chapter twenty five recording by linda johnson